That cold night in December, the Yankees missed a dear opportunity. General Bragg was hustling his Confederates for a massed attack on the Yankees' right flank. Thousands of men, their animals. Anybody with a set of ears could have heard them. Some Yankees even saw them. But the signs were fatally ignored. Murfreesboro, December 31st, 1862. That morning, the dawn stillness would be shattered. 10,000 Confederate soldiers would make sure of that. Fort Sumter and Bull Run seemed an eternity ago. Sleepy towns, creeks, and meadows before unknown would now forever have national recognition. Not two years old, the war had spent the lives of tens of thousands of Americans, most of them in the past 10 months. Out east, Richmond had withstood the seven days battles. Stonewall Jackson was still in the Shenandoah Valley and the Army of Northern Virginia was peaking. Lee had hoped to take the war burden off of Virginia by invading Maryland that fall. And with his escape from Antietam, he'd gotten away with it. The Union government in Washington looked to the West for hope. Federal armies out there had used the past year to begin severing the Confederacy's main artery, the Mississippi. One of the largest accomplishments had been the Union occupation of Nashville, the first Confederate state capital to fall. Yet in the wake of these gains lay a tough, unanswered question, European recognition of the Confederacy. Lincoln had used the Union victory at Antietam to red carpet the Emancipation Proclamation. Pointing the war in the direction of freedom had done much to keep the Europeans at bay. For the meantime, recently federal forces had suffered setbacks in Middle Tennessee, a stalemate in Vicksburg, and a humiliation at Fredericksburg. Soon, the British Parliament would convene. The North desperately needed a victory. The early winter of 1862 had treated the federal soldiers encamped in and around Nashville quite nicely. They'd even received an early Christmas present. In October, William S. Rosecrans, Old Rosie, had taken command of the 14th Army Corps, the troops formerly known as the Army of the Ohio. They would be officially renamed the Army of the Cumberland just days after the Battle of Murfreesboro. Rosecrans had replaced Don Carlos Buell, who was not popular in Washington. The Confederate fall invasion of Kentucky had culminated at Perryville, an indecisive battle allowing the rebels to retreat and regain much of Middle Tennessee. Buell had been hardcore regular army, lacking any respect for the volunteer soldier. He never won the love and entirely lost the confidence of the army he commanded. There was silent rejoicing everywhere when Rosecrans took his place, one soldier wrote. 
Rosecrans knew these men. An Ohioan himself, he understood the Western soldier's pioneering sense of independence and his distaste for authority and anything regulation. Rosecrans also took pains to ensure they had the best equipment and training Washington could provide. Morale improved. By the end of December, this army would be ready to fight. For Confederates in camps around Murfreesboro, their December situation was far more complicated. Under the facade of military ceremony and holiday revelry lay a high command torn with dissent. The fall invasion of Kentucky had achieved little, and its resulting battle at Perryville even less. After the retreat from Kentucky, Jefferson Davis received numerous letters and visits from divisional and corps commanders within the Army of the Tennessee, all asking for the same thing, Braxton Bragg's removal. General Bragg suffered health problems. He tended to lock up in times of stress and he was hated by most of his high command. He liked to argue, point fingers, and place blame. Davis's trip to Murfreesboro earlier in the month had done little to calm the controversy unfinished business that would come back to haunt them at Murfreesboro. John Barleycorn was general in chief, wrote Private Sam Watkins of his experience that winter. Despite the command troubles, the holidays had been delightful. Whiskey flowed freely and Rosecrans was still in Nashville. Yet battle was in the air and Washington was pressing old Rosie to move. The Cumberland River had been low all winter. A rebel preacher put it best. O oh Lord, let the rain descend to fructify the earth and to swell the rivers. But O oh Lord, do not raise the Cumberland sufficient to bring upon the damn Yankee gunboats. But it recently had risen. It would supply Rosecrans' invading army. He'd also learned that Bragg's cavalry was out on raids. The newlywed John Hunt Morgan was in Kentucky, and Nathan Bedford Forrest was in western Tennessee. But the best news of all, under Richmond's orders, Bragg had just sent an entire division, 8,000 men, to reinforce rebel defenses in Mississippi. The timing was perfect. On December 26th, the Federals left Nashville for Murfreesboro. Rosecrans' army of 44,000 Federals moved out in three recently organized wings. Major General Thomas Crittenden, son of the famous Kentucky Senator, led the left wing. The Army's strength lay in its center wing commander, Major General George Pat Thomas. His excellent defensive fighting style would become integral in the next three days. Rosecrans' right wing commander was probably his worst. Major General Alexander McCook was not well regarded by the rank and file, nor the high command. At Perryville, he had deployed his entire corps prematurely in the face of rebel fire. His ineptness would prove disastrous. With Federals on the move, Bragg immediately began to gather his scattered forces, organizing a battle line of 37,000 just northwest of Murfreesboro, straddling the Stones River. On the left was a division under Lieutenant General William Hardy, a dependable corps commander who'd written the book on contemporary military tactics. In the center was Lieutenant General Leonidas Polk. He disobeyed direct orders at Perryville and afterward went public that he had absolutely no faith in Bragg's abilities. On the right was Major General John Breckinridge, a recent Vice President of the United States before the war and probably Bragg's worst personal enemy. The federal advance had been hampered by wet weather. Edward Wood, a private with the Chicago Board of Trade Battery, cynically commented, it rained in torrents all day. We had a lovely time, I assure you. Hard rains turned the back roads into paste. Rebel cavalry and other delays further prolonged the march to four days. As the day ended, December 30th, Rosecrans soldiers were finally in a line of battle in Bragg's front. Oddly, both commanders had drawn up identical battle plans. Each hoped to hit the other's right flank. Success would hinge upon who hit first and who hit the hardest. 
The opposing lines were within a few hundred yards of each other. Fires were scarce. They tend to draw enemy musket and cannon fire. As the frosty, sleepless night dragged on, regimental bands from both sides began dueling their respective tunes. Then a strange thing occurred. A federal band struck up a popular song of the era, Home Sweet Home. Confederate bands joined them. A bittersweet moment, maybe. But tomorrow, it would mean nothing. War would commence. And for many soldiers, this song would be their last. Union Division Commander Phil Sheridan was worried. He'd been up before dawn preparing his men for an attack, an attack his commander, McCook, had told him wouldn't happen. Yet Sheridan sensed it like one would a tornado. All the recent signs of activity and the enemy's camp were hushed, a death-like stillness prevailing in the cedars to our front. Brigadier General August Willock on the extreme right flank wasn't so perceptive. They are so quiet out there that I guess they are all no more. The night had been wet, cold, miserable. Two days of endless waiting was about to end. The anticipation of battle and leftover Christmas whiskey took the chill off the bitter December morning. Surely the retreat from Perryville was fresh in their minds. So was Shiloh. Not eight months ago, it was this Confederate army whose morning attack there had smashed a drowsy Federal foe. They do it today like they did it then, under Dawn's misty cloak. The attack would be classic Confederate. Two divisions, McCowns and Claiborne's, would conduct a massive wheeling maneuver and pummel the Federal right. Rosecrans' plan to falsely extend McCook's flank with phony fires had worked, sort of. The Confederates had compensated by adjusting their attack formation the night before. But Crittenden's attack on the Confederate left would never get off the ground. Bragg would strike first, and his overlapping lines would engulf the Union right. A little after 6 a.m., Roughly 11,000 Confederates of McCown and Claiborne's division stepped out of the Cedar Forest. A Federal private later wrote, it seemed that the whole Confederate army burst out of a piece of woods immediately on the front. One Union officer described it as a thrilling spectacle that a soldier might see once in a lifetime of military service. Johnson's brigade commanders Willock and Kirk both had their men up at dawn coffee boiling, pickets out, they'd seem prepared, but not for this. Their two brigades were hit with six. Earlier that morning, Captain Warren Edgerton, Battery E, 1st Ohio, with Kirk's brigade, had unhitched his horses and sent them behind the lines to be watered. 
The immobilized battery would only get off 16 to 20 rounds of canister before they were overrun. Kirk flung his old regiment, the 34th Illinois, at the Texas and Arkansas troops in his front. The 34th fought desperately, courageously, losing five color bearers. Kirk himself was wounded. He would die seven months later. As Kirk was taken from the field, he screamed at his men to follow suit. If the Federals didn't have enough problems, rebel cavalry under Brigadier General John Wharton had gotten into their rear. So vigorous was the attack of our left upon the enemy's right, I had to travel a distance of two and a half miles before I reached the enemy rear, Wharton wrote. Colonel Louis Zahm's 3rd Ohio Cavalry countered, only to be driven away with artillery fire. Later, Wharton's troopers were hit with a saber charge from the 8th Ohio. The Ohioans were surrounded. That morning, Wharton would take some 1,500 federal prisoners, including the wounded Union Brigadier Kirk, and several hundred supply-laden wagons, creating problems that would hamper the federal forces all day. The battle was less than 30 minutes old, yet the federal line was dissolving. An advancing rebel soldier later commented, the onslaught was so sudden and the slaughter so great that they retreated in confusion. Every fellow for himself and the devil take the hindmost. In less than 30 minutes, two entire federal brigades ceased to exist as a fighting force. Willick's brigade, positioned to the right and rear of Kirk's, had literally been routed in panic of being trampled by Kirk's retreating men. Many of these men wouldn't stop until the Nashville Turnpike, three miles away. Many reminiscent of their days under General Buell shouted as they skedaddled to the rear, We are sold, sold again! With Johnson's Federals shattered, the Confederates continued their huge wheel. Now targeting the new, arcing Federal flank of Davis's division. By this time, Rosecrans had called off Crittenden's attack and had Rousseau's division en route to support the Federal right. Hardy's rebels were experiencing problems of their own. McCown's division had drifted. Claiborne's supporting lines suddenly found themselves no longer in support but on the front line. Patrick Claiborne was just the man you wanted in this position. An Irish emigrant with military experience in the British Army, Claiborne had risen from a private to a brigadier general in less than a year. A savage fighter, he was regularly compared to Stonewall Jackson.
outnumbered but determined. The federal resilience paid off. Claiborne's weary troops finally wavered and broke off their advance. Rebel problems persisted in their center. Corps Commander Leonidas Polk had been feeding his division piecemeal into the vicious musket and cannon crossfire of Woodruff and Sills brigades. The Confederates went in one brigade at a time. Woodruff wrote, they were mowed down like sickles. Loomis's Alabama troops were taunted as they fell back through Vaughn's Texans and Tennesseans. One of Loomis's men angrily shot back, you'll soon find it the hottest place you've ever struck. With those words ringing in their ears, Vaughn and Maney's brigades began their advance. Private Sam Watkins colorfully described it. We raised a whoop and yell and swooped down on those Yankees like a whirl of gust of woodpeckers in a hailstorm. Things didn't remain so cheery. Confusion reigned as Maney's rebels mistook Sheridan's men for their own. The Tennesseans and Texans fell back. In this charge, Sheridan sadly wrote, the gallant Sill was killed. Recollections of his best brigadier would stay with Sheridan until after the war. As a military governor in the West, he would name an Oklahoma fort in Sill's memory. In roughly the same area, the Army of the Tennessee lost an equally important officer. Two battalions of federal regulars faced a Confederate brigade under Brigadier General Rains. The Georgians and North Carolinians entered into a deadly crossfire. The youthful Brigadier Rains died in the assault with a mini ball through the heart. Bragg's left flank had taken severe losses. One third of Hardy's Corps had been killed or wounded. These were veterans, good fighters, men who could never be replaced. Yet their efforts weren't in vain. By 10 a.m., the Federal right had jackknifed back upon itself, forming a V directly in the center of the Confederate line. Polk would hit its apex with everything his Rebel Corps could muster. A battery under Captain Charles Hotailing had been pounding the Rebel attackers all morning. Refusing to run, Hotelling's artillerymen grimly took the Confederate retribution. Wharton's raid that morning had been effective. McCook's ammunition wagons had been sent way behind the lines out of his reach. Consequently, many Federals began running out of cartridges. Sheridan swore vehemently when his troops, out of ammo, were forced to withdraw. This, combined with heated rebel attacks, forced a general retreat which opened a gap near a grove of cedars known to locals as the Round Forest.
before the day was over, the soldiers would rename it. Kells Half Acre. Polk acted swiftly to hit the weakened federal line. The brigades of Chalmers and Donaldson were sent into the salient. Donaldson's Tennesseans split their ranks to move through the burned out remains of the Cowan farmhouse. The brigade's isolated regiments were withered from federal fire in the round forest. One of Donaldson's regiments, the 8th Tennessee, lost 306 of its 472 men, roughly 68%. All day amidst the numerous attacks upon the round forest, one federal brigade stood like a rock, that of Colonel William Hazen. Sure, he had help, but these four regiments had spent the entire morning under almost constant attack, and now were the lead unit of the federal defense. By noon, the federal right had been pushed back almost to the Nashville Turnpike. This would work to Rosecrans' advantage. The tighter front would make shifting troops much simpler. Rosecrans had already strengthened his right with the divisions of Wood and Van Cleve. He'd also been able to reform and supply the morning shattered units safely beyond the Nashville Turnpike. In the Federal Center, Thomas had assembled all the artillery he could round up and put them on a rise behind the round forest. Though he'd ignored Hardy's earlier pleas for reinforcements, at 1 p.m. Bragg ordered Breckinridge to send Polk four brigades. Bragg had become obsessed with the round forest. He would have it, no matter the cost. With little daylight remaining, the death on Hell's Half Acre wasn't quite complete.
The battle had hushed, and the dreadful splendor of this advance can only be conceived, as all description must fall vastly short. Hazen's flowery prose hides the stupidity of the rebel assaults. Again, in piecemeal fashion, Breckinridge's Kentucky brigades marched the littered slopes. And again, they met with carnage. The round forest, Hell's Half Acre, stood. Late on the night of the 31st, Bragg wired Richmond. The enemy had yielded his strong position and is falling back. God has granted us a happy new year. The Federals weren't falling back, though everything looked as if they should. Rosecrans' troops were exhausted and very hungry, thanks in part to Confederate cavalry under General Joe Wheeler. His troopers had been slashing Federal supply wagons in the Federal rear for the past two days. But Rosecrans, ever the tenacious optimist, ended a stormy New Year's Eve meeting with his high command shouting, we will keep right on and eat corn for a week, but we will win this battle. We can and will do it. Martha, I can inform you that I've seen the monkey show at last, and I don't want to see it no more. I can't tell you how many dead men I did see, wrote an Alabama soldier after the battle. It was a New Year's Eve lacking any celebration. Army surgeons tried to keep up. Soldiers tried to sleep. But a battlefield is never silent. The cries of the wounded were indescribable. One Confederate in position near the Round Forest, site of the day's heaviest action, wrote, The frost, the dead, and dying in the dark cedars among which we bivouacked were wild enough for a banquet of ghouls. Rosecrans had spent New Year's Eve strengthening his lines. He'd pulled out of the round forest to bolster his right flank and had ordered a division back across the river to occupy high ground. Then he waited. To his weary troops, a reprieve from battle on the first day of 1863 suited them just fine. Bragg ironically did less. He'd wakened January 1st amazed that the Federals were still there. With his plans awry, he repeated the apathy so prevalent in his past. No battle plan was devised, no major troop movements. Polk did advance into the deserted round forest and Breckinridge moved back into his former positions. But Bragg waited, and as he did, the victory that was once so firmly in his grasp began to slowly become utterly out of reach. January 2nd began much like the day before. Rosecrans waited. Bragg grew nervous. Mid-morning, he ordered his artillery to probe Yankee positions west of the Round Forest. The rebel cannonballs rolled up the macadamized Nashville turnpike like balls on a bowling alley, according to a federal witness. Breckinridge, on the Confederate right, had done some scouting of his own. Directly across his position was the Federal Brigade of John Beatty and six guns from the 3rd Wisconsin Artillery. They commanded high ground, good cover, and a wide open field of fire, a formidable position. Soon, Breckinridge's soldiers would find out just how formidable it was. Just one day after Christmas, a young Kentucky soldier was executed. His family in need, the soldier had been caught as a deserter. Bragg had approved it, touching off more problems with Breckinridge. The Kentucky troops hated Bragg, claiming the abhorrence of him part of a Kentuckian's creed. The recent flare-up was only a week old as Bragg ordered Breckinridge to attack one of the strongest Yankee positions on the field. Breckinridge argued vehemently against the order. The Federal artillery would slaughter his men, Bragg dismissed him. Sir, my information is different. I have given an order to attack the enemy in your front and expect it to be obeyed. Breckinridge had no choice. He began deploying his men. Rosecrans, Crittenden, and most of the Union left could plainly see the rebel activity. Immediately, the Federal line was reinforced with infantry. More importantly, Crittenden's chief of artillery, Captain John Mendenhall, began assembling guns on high ground. 
By the time of the attack, his artillery would number 58 guns. At 4 p.m., Breckenridge shouted, up my men and charge them. Bragg wanted the attack to begin late in the day. Darkness would deter a federal counterattack. As Breckenridge predicted, the open field became litter with Tennessee and Kentucky dead. Surprisingly, the attackers surged on. The Federals began to give way. At 4.30, Breckenridge's division had done more than ever expected, but his men couldn't stop. Ignoring orders to halt, they continued to chase the fleeing Federals, but they went too far. Leading the charge was Brigadier General Roger Hansen's Orphan Brigade. Hailing from Kentucky, a state still in the Union, the Orphan Brigade had no state to go home to. As the orphans advanced, they came into full view of Mendenhall's batteries. Breckenridge's three other brigades were unfortunately right behind the orphans. One Federal observed that the rebels had opened the door of hell and the devil himself was there to greet them.
the Confederate attack soon lost its momentum, becoming disorganized. Union Colonel John Miller's brigade hit the dazed rebels, encouraging other counterattacks along the entire battle line. In a matter of minutes, the momentum of battle had shifted to the Federals. The 78th Pennsylvania swept forward, capturing the colors of the 26th Tennessee. dark, having driven the Confederates back across Stones River, the Federals called it quits. And the Battle of Murfreesboro, for all technical purposes, was over. Breckinridge's division had been destroyed. Seeing his familiar lines considerably shorter, he cried, my poor orphans, my poor orphan brigade, they have cut it to pieces. Among the dead orphans was its leader, Hansen was hit with a shell fragment during the charge. His wound would prove fatal. In two days of fighting, both armies had lost some of their best. Rains, Kirk, Hansen, Sill, irreplaceable field commanders. Yet even more important were the 18,500 Americans killed and wounded at Murfreesboro. Rosecrans had lost 23% of all his troops engaged. Bragg, 27 percent. The night of January 3rd, Bragg retreated. He'd spent the day waiting, almost as if to see whether the Federals would retreat or not. They didn't. Common prudence and the safety of my army, upon which the safety of our cause depended, left no doubt in my mind as to the necessity of my withdrawal from so unequal a contest, Bragg wrote. By the next morning, the Army of the Tennessee would again be in full retreat. Rosecrans was astonished, and Washington was ecstatic. President Lincoln simply telegraphed Rosecrans, God bless you. Nashville was secure. The Emancipation Proclamation had gone into effect on January 1st, and the Union victory at Murfreesboro was a perfect bookend to the federal victory of Antietam that had brought its conception the Europeans would stay out of the war. During the Confederate retreat, General Bragg happened upon a lone straggler. The general asked him if he was in Bragg's army. The straggler retorted, Bragg's army? He's got none. He shot half of them up in Kentucky, and the other half got killed at Murfreesboro. 